Unless we can start the recording part. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Atiku Jawan, uh, as you have seen. So I'm not going to read uh, all his you know, uh, uh, biography here. And he has got impressive CV, as you can see. Uh, and he is well known uh, in the research community. Uh, and so I think uh, probably you're also aware of, uh, he's also editor in chief, uh, very good uh, high impact uh, factor journal, especially. Uh, Journal of Networks and Computer Applications. So uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's no need to go through all of these you know, uh, details, um, his bio, but just to highlight a few points. I think uh, many of our students are familiar with Professor Atiku Jawan, especially through the JNC journal. Uh, my student also published a number of papers. Um, but uh, from the educational background, uh, Professor uh, M. Atiku Jawan obtained his MS and PhD degree uh, in electrical and electronics engineering uh, from the University of Manchester um, in 1984 and uh, 1987. Uh, also, I think um, we're familiar with the Atiku Zaman also work in a uh, number of you know, universities uh, in terms of uh, you know lecturing and also um, uh, researcher. Uh, I think previously also he served uh, Monash University as I know from them. Uh, and so moved to US and uh, with now is Oklahoma you know, University. Uh, he is also actively involved with IEEE activities you know, and a uh, number of, as you can see, uh, high performance switching and routing symposium is actually served as uh, Globecom, uh, you know, many years, uh, IEEE VTS, and also some other you know, like uh, Infocom conferences and so on. And I'm also actually familiar with him uh, by looking at you know, symposium and a co-chair, uh, Professor Atiku Jaman. Um, he received also a number of um, awards uh, from IEEE. Uh, I think as you can see from here, uh, IEEE Distinguished uh, Technical Achievement Award, uh, Satellite Communication Award, uh, NASA Group Achievement Award, and so on. Uh, in terms of the publications, actually, you know, as you can see, uh, also uh, he wrote uh, as a co-author, uh, Performance of TCP IP and AT ATM Networks. Uh, I have actually uh, you know, read this book also and has uh, published uh, over 350 referred publications, you know, um, and so all of these things actually available from his website. Uh, his uh, research is also, I think, um, matching with our students and also it's myself uh, in terms of the transport layer protocols, wireless and mobile communication networks, uh, ad hoc networks, satellite uh, power wire networking and optical communications. Um, he's also actively involved uh, in terms of research funding uh, from uh, National Science Foundation uh, and also other you know, Air Force uh, US uh, and also within the, I think, uh, Oklahoma Transport uh, Department, uh, Highway Safety Office and so on. So uh, in a nutshell, Atiku Zawan has got impressive CV, you know, as you can see, and uh, most of our uh, distinguished lecturers, especially DL is actually high profile people. So that's all from me. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, you know, Professor Atik Zuman can start, uh, you know, his talk. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharkar, for the introduction. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to be uh, invited to this DL lecturer program in New Zealand. I have been, I lived in Australia for five years. And whenever I travel to US, a lot of the times I used to change planes in Auckland. And it was a real opportunity this time to actually go out of the airport and see New Zealand. But unfortunately we couldn't, uh, this could not happen because of this uh, situation now. But hopefully I'll be able to come and visit you guys uh, physically sometime in the near future. Uh, so I have been working on, uh, how to connect space assets or whatever the spacecrafts and the space assets we have to the internet, uh, the terrestrial internet. And this was a big project from NASA, which is the space agency in the US. Their objective was to be able to connect the spacecrafts and the equipment on board the spacecraft to the ground internet so that it forms part of the terrestrial internet. This will give the researchers a lot of flexibility and uh, opportunity to download different types of data and add with different applications. Uh, so I'm going to discuss those issues and challenges. Um, can you hear me all right? 
Professor, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And what about the slides? Are they clear? Yep, I can see also in our first slide. Okay, thank you. Um, if the audio breaks down or what, if anything happens, uh, let me know. And uh, feel free to interrupt me. I mean, this is, we don't have, we have about 26 participants, so it should be, uh, should not be an issue if you want to interrupt me at any point in the presentation. All right, so. Okay. Uh, Let me get started with what are the advantages of satellites over terrestrial networks. We are familiar with terrestrial networks. The phone we have has internet connected to it. It has the 4G network connected to it. And what we are not very familiar with are the satellite networks because that is not a household commodity. The, those networks are mainly used by uh, people who are in remote areas, uh, Department of Defense, uh, all those people. So it's not a household com commodity. So one of the big advantages of satellite networks is ubiquitous coverage. It covers remote places like mountains, oceans. If you are in the aircraft, the only way you can communicate nowadays with the internet is through satellite. If you are in a ship, uh, you have to rely on satellite for communication. If you are in a battlefield, there is no 3G, there's no 4G in the battlefield. There's no Wi-Fi, of course. So you only rely on a satellite. And of course, nowadays you can see when we are driving, everybody has a GPS that's coming from the satellites. And you can see wherever you go, most of the places you can receive these satellite uh, signals. So satellite has a ubiquitous coverage and is very reliable. It never breaks down, uh, it's very reliable. And especially in regions which is very remote, and underserved, you don't have any other network, satellite coverage is there. And satellite-based uh, applications have a global coverage. Uh, these 4G, Wi-Fi, whatever you call these are very small in coverage. 4G covers cities and highways, but if you go to the mountains or forest, there is no 4G. Uh, but satellite covers the whole world. That's one big advantage of satellite networks. So if satellites are used for communication, it offers a single platform for communication in contrast to what we do nowadays. When we are at home, we use Wi-Fi. When we are outside our home, we use 4G. Uh, and when we are communicating with our devices, uh, between the devices, we use Bluetooth. So there are a lot of different platforms which are all connected together to form a patchwork of terrestrial networks, which works. But satellite permits a single platform uh, because you don't have to have many networks, just one network is enough to cover uh, whatever you want to connect. The growth of satellites has been steady. Uh, it has not been exponential because of the applications, because of the users. As I said, the users are mainly uh, Department of Defense, uh, um, those maritime people, the aircraft, all those, it's not a household item. So. Uh, the growth of the satellite market has been steady. Cisco expects, you know, almost 50 billion devices will be connected to the internet by 2020, and a lot of them would be through a satellite. Although the terrestrial networks were used to dominate, but whenever we want to connect uh, devices which are not reachable by the terrestrial networks, we have to rely on satellite. And if you uh, happen to uh, work with space agencies, you will find that they are trying to connect everything uh, on the, in, the, in the space to the terrestrial network uh, using satellite connections. I'll give you a quick overview uh, or a quick uh, overview of what happens or what are the instruments usually in a, a satellite which are launched by agencies like NASA. Uh, these equipment vary, but just to give you a rough idea, whenever a satellite is launched, there is a mission. It, it is either looking up in space for space discovery, or it is looking down at Earth to observe the Earth. So those are the two things satellites do. Of course, there are other satellites which are communication satellites, but in observation satellites, you carry a lot of equipment depending on what you want to observe, what you want to measure. For example, uh, the physicists might have equipment. You can probably uh, recognize some of them. The, people who are involved with uh, weather prediction, they will have equipment on satellite. Those who are 
involved with predicting uh, forest fires or actually detecting forest fires or in a disaster like tsunami, they have a different type of equipment. So a satellite can carry different types of equipment depending on the data they are trying to collect. And in the slide, you can see different types of equipment. This is just a sample of the equipment carried in one of the satellites called Juno. Uh, that's the science uh, th that's carrying all the science equipment. Uh, question is, is it possible to connect these uh, onboard science equipment to the internet? Uh, currently, they are not connected to the internet. You collect data from these equipment through dedicated lines, like what we used to do uh, when we, what uh, still we do when we uh, make a phone connection, it's a dedicated line. Uh, but as we know, if we can connect using internet, it allows us to use thousands of applications. So the question is, can we connect all these devices which are in this spacecraft in the satellite to the internet? If you want to connect to the, to the internet, uh, we need to find out what type of satellites there are and what, is, what are the characteristics. So if you have uh, a spacecraft, a satellite is the type of spacecraft, uh, then you can have IP addressable payload or these devices. So if you have, an, if you have a, a telescope up on the satellite, you can attach an IP address to it, uh, or you can attach an IP address to one of the sensors there, or radars or telescopes or weather observing equipment, whatever you have on the satellites, you can have an IP address, just like in the terrestrial uh, network. We have an IP address to our, with our phone, with our laptop, with our watch, with everything. And these devices which are on the satellites, they are like, like what we call things in the IoT terminology. And we want to connect these to the internet so that the space becomes part of the IoT domain. One of the things we have to understand is uh, satellites are, are rotating around the earth. The geostationary satellites are stationary with respect to the earth. Other than that, the low earth orbiting and the medium earth orbiting satellites are rotating around the earth at a speed which is not the same speed as the rotation of the earth, which means that if you're looking up in the sky, these satellites are coming and going uh, if you could actually see them. So if you want to connect the devices from the satellite to the terrestrial internet, uh, you come into this problem of mobility. So mobility management becomes a big issue if you want to connect uh, devices in the satellite to the terrestrial internet. Let me give you some examples of how the mobility happens in a uh, space environment. There are many types of mobility. Uh, I'm going to discuss only two types. One is in the link layer handoff. Now these satellites are moving around, so they need to hand off between themselves. So those are called inter-satellite handoff. And there are network layer handoffs, uh, and there are two types I'm going to discuss. Uh, one of them is the case when the satellite is being used as a router for communication. The second one is when the uh, satellite is used to collect data, either looking up into the sky or looking down onto the earth, and it has to download the data down to the earth. In that case, it looks like a mobile host in the sense that uh, it is uh, a device, which is a host, which is generating data, and it is mobile in the sense that the satellites are moving. So the host is also moving. Let me give an example of the inter-satellite handoff. So this is a case where there is a ground station. And as all of us know that satellites download data through ground stations. So in this particular case, uh, this satellite is in communication with the ground station. But after some time, the satellite will go away and a new satellite will be connected to the ground station. So this sort of movement of the low earth orbiting satellites causes handoff of the satellites with the ground station. And uh, this is, the sat this is the handoff called inter this is the handoff called inter-satellite handoff. That means the ground station has hand handed off from one satellite to another satellite. The other two cases are mostly at the network layer handoff. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this scientist is in a remote place where she does not have access to internet, and she needs to access internet, so she connects to the ground station and the ground station connects to the, sat sorry, she connects to the satellite and the satellite will eventually connect to the ground station. That's how she accesses the internet. 
And this is a typical case when we are in the aircraft, when you're flying, or if you are in a ship, that you connect to the satellite directly and the satellite in turn connects to the ground station on Earth. But if these satellites are uh, low Earth orbiting, then after some time, uh, the satellite will move away and the scientist will have to connect to a different satellite which comes under, uh, under which uh, it comes because satellites have footprint. So uh, this requires a handoff of, of her connection from the previous satellite to this new satellite which has just moved in. So this is another case of uh, handoff. And in this particular case, the satellites are being used as routers to route the connection from the remote computer back to Earth. Here's the second case of the satellite, which is being used as a mobile host. In this case, the satellites have equipment on board and they are collecting data. And those data have to be downloaded down to Earth for people to analyze. And the way it is done is uh, the satellite connects to the ground station and the computers are connected to servers uh, which, are, which are loaded up with data from the ground stations. So data from the satellites flow to the ground stations and eventually to the computer where they are being analyzed. But this satellite uh, collects data continuously. And since it is moving, it will disconnect from this ground station and, this, and connect with a different ground station. And there is handoff involved in there. So there are issues like what happens to the data which have not been downloaded completely. All those issues come in and also how to get the new IP address, uh, how, to manage the how to manage the mobility. So mobility, manage is a, mobility management is a big issue in, in the uh, space network, especially when you're using low Earth orbiting satellites. So I just gave you these examples to illustrate that there are lots of handoffs going on in space. And that requires uh, mobility management just like the terrestrial environment. So at one time, uh, the space agencies and the Department of Defense, all those people had lots of money, tons of money. Whenever they had a problem, they used to develop those solutions from scratch. Uh, you have seen all this stuff happening with uh, Department of Defense and uh, NASA and any big agency, government agency. But money being tight nowadays, uh, the space agencies have started thinking of how can we do the mobility management with a limited budget. If you have to do it, do it with limited budget, the first thing you do is try to see how other people have done it or have other people solve this issue. So the issue of mobility management uh, in terrestrial environment has already been looked at. So NASA wanted to look at those solutions uh, and mobile IP is a solution which is used in the terrestrial networks. And NASA wanted to look at the mobile IP uh, solution and then develop that for their applications in space. So it's a matter of adaptation to space rather than developing a solution from scratch. So how does the mobile IP work? It's a forwarding mechanism like what we are used to in the US postal system and in other postal systems as well. Uh, a person is living at 35 Morton Street in New York, and that person moves to uh, another address somewhere else. What, what uh, he does, he goes to the post, post office in New York and submits this form uh, saying that my name is such and such. I have moved from this address to this address. Please forward all my letters for the next three months to my new address. He fills in this form and gives it to the post office from where he has moved. And so this mechanism is forwarding mechanism. The letters are, will, be, will be coming to New York, but they will not be delivered to 95 Morton Street. They will be forwarded to the new city and then forwarded to the new address. So, so when mails come to the address in New York, it will be intercepted by the post office and forwarded to the new address. So it is a forwarding mechanism. And the same mechanism, uh, same principle of forwarding is used in mobile IP, which is the mobility management solution in the terrestrial environment. What happens is uh, this is a home network where this laptop belongs to. That's a foreign network where this mobile host just moved in. 
and when it moves to the to the foreign network it connects to the foreign network and it sends an update to the home agent at the home saying that i have actually moved to a different network and here is my new ip address as soon as this location update is sent to the home agent uh, the packets coming from the from the uh, correspondent node that means the node with which this laptop was communicating those packets are coming to the home agent that means the home router and they are not delivered to the laptop because the laptop is not not there in the home network it is encapsulated and forwarded to the foreign network and it has a foreign agent there which understands all these encapsulated packets the foreign agent decapsulates the packets and delivers it to the mobile host when the mobile host sends an acknowledgement to these packets the acknowledgements go to the foreign agent and then the foreign agent it goes back to the correspondent node through the internet in a direct path so the to summarize the packets from the correspondent node comes to the home agent and they are forwarded to the foreign agent which delivers it to the mobile host when the replies go back the replies do not go through the home agent they go to the foreign agent and directly to the correspondent node so that's how mobile ip works and as you can see it is based on the principle of forwarding used by the post office as well so what are the main drawbacks of this forwarding technique uh, which is used in mobile ip now as i'm saying i'm talking about the base mobile ip the fundamental mobile ip of course there have been patches which have been developed to solve lot of these issues but if we go back to the base mobile ip we need to have new infrastructure connected to the internet the home agent and the foreign agent these are the new things we need to incorporate in the network there is a high hand of latency and packet loss rate when you are handing off from the home agent to the foreign agent you have to register with the foreign agent the foreign agent has to inform the home agent you have to do a location update all sorts of things happen at and even if you if you run this protocol in your lab you will find that it takes about 10 to 12 seconds for this hand off to take place even in a very controlled lab environment and during that packet during that 12 seconds or 10 seconds packets coming from the correspondent node are cannot be forwarded by the home agent because the the uh, there is no connection the home agent doesn't know where the laptop is those packets have to be buffered or if the buffer is full those packets will be thrown away so there might be packet loss at the home agent if there is a uh, lack of buffer so those two issues are in inherent in the way mobile ip works uh, the latency and the packet loss the the routing path is very inefficient uh in the sense packets coming from the correspondent node come to the home agent and then they are forwarded to the foreign agent so the so if if you are uh if you are if you are uh, actually very close to the for correspondent node but it still cannot come directly to the foreign agent it has to go all the way to the home agent and then forward it to the foreign agent and this is very inefficient in terms of routing uh there is other issues uh like the triangular routing or you might have come across that the packets are sent back to the correspondent node directly and there are also conflicts with the network solutions like ingress filtering which says that uh if you are in a network and trying to send packets using a source address which does not belong to the network the ingress filtering will stop those packets from flowing so in a in a mobile ip solution the uh the mobile devices have to send packets using the source address which is the home agents so that all the packets go there so that is a conflict with the uh with some of the so the mobile ip has conflict with network solutions and ingress filtering is just one of those uh security solutions so there are a lot of issues which are which uh, are inherent in the base mobile ip and people have come up with solutions independently so there is a solution to the packet loss there is a solution to the latency there is another solution to inefficient routing uh, there are solutions for security security problem issues and all these solutions if you put them together is a patchwork of solutions which which does not work very well does not work very efficiently so in order to uh, so when when nasa was looking at or still looking at connecting the terrestrial uh, internet to the space to the space they were actually looking at mobile ip and how to 
uh, adapt mobile IP for the space. And there, if they could do it, there would be a lot of applications which would benefit from this. And NASA, whom we have been working with for a long time, they have been uh, looking at different applications. One of them is to measure the precipitation uh, on Earth. So they have a project called Global Precipitation Measurement. And they found that connecting the devices on the spacecraft, which are measuring those global precipitation could benefit a lot if we are able to connect it to the internet. And I'm talking about these big projects. So another project is the communication navigation demonstration of shuttle. Basically they are trying to connect the shuttle to all the satellites and everywhere are all the ground stations. So that's another big project uh, they have uh, so that they can connect everything together, all the different types of satellites and the spacecrafts and even the, uh, the shuttle. Uh, there is another project which they are working on, which is the to find out how the nodes uh, work if they are connected to the terrestrial internet. To do all this stuff, NASA actually worked with Cisco to develop a mobile router. And there are other projects also where uh, those projects would benefit if we connect, if we could connect the spacecraft to the to the terrestrial internet, and uh, Wincom is one of those projects. This is related to weather stuff, and there are a lot of other projects which could benefit if we could connect. So the so NASA has a lot of motivation to connect uh, the devices on the spacecraft to the terrestrial internet. So this slide I just presented to. Uh, motivate you to the fact that there will be a lot of advantages of connecting the spacecraft to the terrestrial internet. The, the question is, when NASA is, NASA is not going to use mobile IP directly because uh, we are considering a space environment and that is completely different from the terrestrial environment because of long propagation delays, a lot of errors, mobility stuff and all this stuff. So they are trying to develop uh, or modify the mobile IP and make it to work for the space environment. So at that time, we proposed to NASA uh, from, from our university as a, as a grant that we want to investigate a method for mobility management in space, which would be very efficient, it would be secure, and it will do a seamless handoff uh, in a satellite environment. And it would also be applicable in the terrestrial environment. One thing these big agencies want to do, they want to see if, though, if the solutions they will develop can also be applied in the terrestrial environment. That is, if they can, if they can do it, then its uh, return on investment is higher because the users in the terrestrial environment, there are much, many more users. So our objective was to, as I said, you can see it in the red, red box, is to develop an efficient, secure, and seamless handoff scheme, uh, which would have all the advantages or which will have all the features of mobile IP, but it will not have the disadvantages of mobile IP. So what are the disadvantages of the mobile IP? As I said earlier, it needs new hardware. It has a lot of latency and packet loss. It has, uh, the data path is inefficient. It creates problem when, ex when working with uh, the security solutions a survivability issue, if the home agent breaks, uh, no communication can happen. You cannot scale too much because there is one home agent and it will put a lot of load on it. Uh, manageability is difficult because the normal uh, network engineers, they're not familiar with mobile IP, so you have to manage it with expert people. So all these uh, issues are there in the uh, mobile IP domain and we wanted to Again, the focus, uh, our focus was to develop a solution which will not have any of those issues of mobile IP, but it will have all the features of mobile IP. That means it, will, it can do everything mobile IP can do, except it will not have the disadvantages of mobile IP. And we wanted to develop a solution from scratch. So we came up with this uh, idea called Sigma, uh, and it is a, mobility architecture, which does seamless handoff between, between uh, satellites. So in order to solve those problems of mobile IP, 
we looked at how people did those solutions. And we found that those solutions are all piecemeal solutions in the sense everybody only handled one problem and developed a solution. We thought that instead of, instead of doing that sort of approach, let's try to see what happens in a mobile IP, what are the issues, what are the fundamental issues that create all these, all these problems? Can we identify any fundamental issue that creates all these problems? Then if we can solve that fundamental problem, then all these other problems are going to go away. And we found that the way mobile IP works is by uh, having location management and handoff being done uh, by being done by the same entity. And that gives rise to all the six or seven problems I mentioned. So if we could decouple the location management from the handoff, then all those, all those problems will be gone by itself. We don't have to do anything. Now, what is location management? This is to find out where your mobile device is and handoff is concerned with how to move from one access point to another access point. These are two different things, but in mobile IP, they are coupled together which gives rise to all those issues we discussed. So we found we need to decouple those two. And then uh, those two are important functions, but we want to decouple them and carry those two functions in parallel, not, not uh, in, in sequence or not by one entity. We want to decouple them and run them in parallel to data transmission. And also we want to allow the layer uh, which, whose performance we are trying to optimize to do the handoff. Like the mobile IP does the handoff at the network layer, but the network layer is not worried about the performance issue of communication. The amount of data that can be transferred from point A to point B is the headache of the transport layer. Network layer only gets the data from point A to point B. It does not worry about throughput or performance of data communication. So if we give the handoff, uh, the responsibility of the handoff to the transport layer, which is responsible for optimizing the throughput, then of course we can integrate them together. So that is another decision we made, uh, you know, we, we thought we made to develop the new scheme called Sigma. So in order to do this, uh, we needed to look at a completely different protocol uh, for the transport layer, which could do all this stuff. And we, so before I go into that protocol, let me tell you the basic concept of Sigma, the protocol we developed. If you look at mobile IP, you disconnect from the, uh, you disconnect from the home network before you connect to the foreign network. And that creates all this uh, latency and the packet loss and all this stuff. So you are, the mobile IP is based on uh, first disconnect and then connect. We thought that we need to solve that issue in order to solve the latency and the packet loss. So we said uh, we don't fall. We want to change that philosophy of mobile IP, which is based on break the connection before you make a new connection. We will do. We will make a connection first before we break the connection. So it's very similar to if you're looking for a job. Uh, while you are with a previous employer, you don't resign from the previous employer before looking for a job. You first look for the second job or the new job. And once you get the job, you disconnect or you resign from the previous job. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Because if you resign from the previous job first, then money is not going to flow in while you're looking for the job. In this particular case, data is not going to flow in. So our principle is to make a connection first and then, dis and then disconnect the old, old access point. But this sort of stuff you cannot do with the common protocols we have been using, which is the TCP. So in order to do it, we need to have two connections at the same time. So when this mobile host is in the overlapping region, we want to set up a connection, a new connection with a new access point. And then when this mobile most moves completely to the foreign network, we will disconnect. This requires one special feature, which is the transport layer connection needs to have two different paths. That's one thing. Number two, in the transport layer connection, 
you need to add another another connection, a new access point, a new IP address. And these two things are not possible in TCP. As you know, in TCP, you uh, establish endpoints and then you start communication. You cannot change endpoints. You cannot add new endpoints. Uh, you have to totally disconnect and then start new connections. So in order to allow two connections to be uh, active at the same time, we looked at the protocol or the transport layer protocol called SCTP or Stream Control Transmission Protocol. And this allows you to have two connections at the same time and allows you to add a connection or drop a connection. And it has all the advantages of TCP, but it has these two features. One is called multi-homing, another is called multi-streaming. And we're, we'll be using the multi-homing feature to implement our Sigma protocol. And many of you may not be familiar with SCTP. Uh, it is a transport layer protocol which sits at the same place at TCP and UDP. And it comes bundled with the Linux. It comes bundled with the Windows, but we don't use it. It is a standard protocol. It's not something we discovered. It's a standard protocol, which is standardized by IETF. But we don't need to use it because most people are happy with TCP and UDP. They've been using it for a long time. And there are lots and lots and thousands of millions of applications which are using TCP and UDP. And you don't want to move all those applications to SCTP unless you really need it. So we are going to use SCTP to have the multiple connections and transport layer to do the handoff. And that's how the multi-homing works. You have a computer A and computer B which want to communicate. You, as, you set up an SCTP association rather than a connection. And in that association, we'll have two connections, one through interface one, which is could be a 4G network. Another one could be a connection through a Wi-Fi network. So you can have, you can communicate between two computers using, let's say this is my computer here at home. I can communicate with your computer through, three, through 4G, through my cell phone. And also I can communicate over Wi-Fi, which will allow me higher data rate. It will allow me redundancy. It will allow me a lot of stuff. And then as I said, these multiple connections and utilizing these multiple connections is not possible with TCP, but the SCTP allows you to do all of this stuff. So let's look at the signaling procedure, what happens when we use a Sigma for handoff. In this particular case, the scientist is receiving data from the satellite, which has been collecting data uh, from Earth. Uh, the first of all, the satellite, when the moves away, it obtains a new IP address from the new ground station. Uh, and the ground station addresses are different because IP addresses are tied to geographical locations. Then the satellite notifies the remote computer that I have a new IP address through which I will start communicating soon. Uh, the satellite keeps on moving because it's a low earth orbiting satellite. And at one point it sets the primary communication mechanism through this dish. Uh, through this access point, through this uh, base station, uh, which means it tells this remote computer, I will be communicating with you with a new IP address. And it also updates the location manager saying that I am, I have a new IP address because if people want to, or devices want to communicate with the satellite, they must be, they must know the IP address. And when the satellite moves further away, it disconnects from the previous ground station and the new connection becomes a primary. And as you can see, if you can do that, there'll be no latency, there'll be no loss of packets because you are first connecting to a new access point or a new ground station before you're disconnecting from the old one. And we, so we tested our scheme uh, with different networks. Uh, can we hand off from one device to another device when there are different types of networks. So here is a, an example, here's an example of a Wi-Fi network inside the building. And as soon as you walk out of the building, so in this particular case, this person has a mobile device, which, which emulates actually, or which mimics the satellite. But we are, I'm trying to illustrate with a person and a mobile device because it is easier for us to comprehend uh, rather than if I just put a satellite over there. So in this particular case, this uh, person is communicating with the correspondent node through the Wi-Fi network. As soon as the person walks out of the uh, 
uh, building, the device gets an IP address from the cellular network. So this person now has two IP addresses, one from the Wi-Fi, one from the cellular network. And the device is using both the connections to communicate with the correspondent node. Now, if you look at our current scenario, let's say if I take my smart, smartphone, my smartphone actually has an IP address from the 4G network. It also has an IP address from the Wi-Fi, but when I'm at home, it is only using the Wi-Fi IP address. It cannot use the 4G at the same time. But in our case, since we're using SCTP, we can actually have two different paths uh, to communicate with the correspondent node. So when this person moves to the cellular network, completely cellular network, out of range of Wi-Fi, uh, this connection will be disconnected and the device will only communicate using the cellular network. And if the person keeps on moving, eventually it will go out of the coverage of the cellular network. Let's say it goes to a place where there's no cellular network, might be a forest. At that time, the device will get an IP address from the satellite and it will communicate with the corresponding node using the satellite and it will be a smooth handoff just like the previous one. Uh, initially, it will be connected to the cellular network and the satellite network, but as it moves towards the satellite network, it will disconnect from the cellular network and use the satellite only. We actually ran this demonstration, which was very successful. Uh, we had the Wi-Fi network in our lab and we used the Sprint, uh, the Sprint towers, the Sprint network to, to, uh, to hand off from the Wi-Fi to the Sprint. And we could do this handoff from the Wi-Fi to the Sprint connection without telling the Sprint people or without telling the university's IT people that we are going to do this handoff. If you are, if you are trying to do this handoff using mobile IP, you have to involve the university people and the Sprint people because they have to put in the home agent and the foreign agent. So our solution is completely transparent. It's end-to-end -end, uh, handoff. So our, uh, our solution works at the transport layer. So that's one big advantage of this scheme that we can do the handoff without telling anyone that we, will, we need to do a handoff. Uh, can you change something in your network? So that was a very successful demonstration of that concept that it's an end-to-end -end handoff without any intervention required from the network operators. So initially we st started doing a uh, basic test of the, two, of the two schemes, whether we can really do it or not. And this was a demonstration using a test, net, test setup in our lab. Uh, we had a home agent and then a foreign agent, very similar, very, uh, a setup which is very similar to most people who are doing mobile IP research. And we had a mobile node which was moving from this access point to the other access point. And the handoff was being done by mobile IP. And we used exactly the same setup to hand, off, to hand off using our scheme called Sigma. And this is the setup we use for Sigma. And we did not change any hardware, uh, same access points, same gateways, exactly the same thing, except that we are using Sigma to hand off between the access points. So in the Sigma case, the mobile node first gets an, gets an IP address from the new access point. It tells the correspondent node that I have a new IP address the correspondent node adds that new IP address to the connection uh, from this correspondent node to the laptop. Remember that if you are doing this with TCP IP, you cannot do it. Once you have set up a connection from the correspondent node to the mobile device through the home agent, you cannot add a new IP address to that connection, nor can you delete that old one. So we have been using HTTP in order to make this handoff possible. So we, one, uh, limitation of our scheme is you have to use uh, SCTP protocol uh, with all your applications. But that's not a big issue because we were developing this solution for NASA and NASA has, has a only limited number of, limited number of applications and they have the source code. So they can easily compile the source code to work with SCTP. And compiling or recompiling a source code to work with SCTP is no big deal. It's, uh, for example, we converted a, converted a video server and a video client from TCP to SCTP, and it took a graduate student only one week, including the learning curve. So the next time he or she will do it, it will take probably a day. 
is is basically trying is basically try finding out the tcp calls and changing them to the equivalent http calls and recompiling so the results from these two uh, test beds the very basic results this is for the mobile ip handoff and as we can see that uh, as time progresses the mobile ip the mobile device is moving and we recorded the throughput of the mobile device versus time and as you can see the throughput is varying and these variations are due to normal tcp congestion control is a normal uh, is an operational network in our university so these are all fluctuations coming from the normal operation this has nothing to do with handoff the handoff took place here i put a red bar over there to show that the handoff is taking place and you can see the data rate went to zero between 50 or let's say 45 to 55 over 10 seconds there was no data coming to the mobile device let's compare this with the sigma handoff for exactly the same uh, hardware and you can see the data communication again fluctuates a lot like before uh, and these fluctuations are because of congestion control of sctp which is very similar to tcp and also because of congestion in the operational network we're using uh, from the university. So if I ask, if I give you this uh, chart and ask you, can you guess where the handoff took place? Most people would say probably here, but we looked at the log and found that the handoff took place actually between 22 seconds and you know, 25 seconds, something like that. And you can see that the data rate did not fall at all. I mean, this fall of data is not because of handoff. It's just normal operation like other falls in data. So if I don't tell you where the handoff took place, the handoff is completely seamless. And you will not even know, the application will not even know that a handoff took place. So this was the basic demonstration of our protocol. Now, once you uh, show a basic demonstration, of course, we did lots and lots of work over six, seven years to look at every aspect of Sigma security, throughput, timing values, every aspect of Sigma, which are all in the publications, <coughs> excuse me. And we published about 40, 50 papers on the Sigma protocol, and they are all available on the internet. Uh, anyone can find it. Uh, but if you want to implement it in a space network, this is a real operational network. These simulations and these small test beds are not going to help much. Let me give you some idea about how things are implemented in real operational stuff in large scale. So this is NASA's uh, chart called technology readiness level and is also used by Department of Defense in order to find out how mature a technology is for implementation. Excuse me. So they use a thermometer like thing and the technology readiness level one, two, three, four, and so on. When, you, when the technology reaches technology readiness level nine, then it is ready for implementation, either in space, if you are working with NASA, or in aircraft or tanks or in the battlefield, if you are working with DOD. And if you look at the steps, how these are measured, first of all, the basic technology research happens. And then the next step is to prove the feasibility of that research of the basic thing. Then the technology development takes place. Then the technology demonstration and then you develop the subsystems which you are going to implement. And then finally, if everything succeeds, then you do a system test and then launch the operation. That means your technology is used in the, in the real case. If I translate these steps into the way we do in our uh, research environment, at the very bottom is technology concept or applications that are formulated. And these are coming from basic science, physics, chemistry, all those stuff, basic concepts. And then once we have the concept, then we do analytical and experimental uh, work. And it could be, I mean, you could think of it as stochastic modeling, NS2 simulation, all this stuff are actually at TRL3, at the very, bot very bottom of the uh, TRL chart. And once the simulation works and the modeling, all these things predict good results, then we move to building a, a uh, Linux prototype probably, a uh, Linux based prototype with a Cisco router and lab environment. We, have, we are used to doing this. Once the modeling, and the, uh, modeling and the simulation works, we usually build a prototype in our lab. 
And in order, so this is still TRL4. In order to move to TRL5, you have to implement this prototype with, with real space hardware. So if you are uh, considering what is real space hardware, uh, if you are implementing it in space, it will be radiation hardened, for example. It must be able to work with low power. If you are, if the if your real environment is war field, then your hardware must be able to tolerate vibrations. Uh, they must be lightweight. They must be able to tolerate high temperature because you might be using it in a desert. All these things you have to test. Uh, in a, that's a real, uh, a real hardware you have to use in order to prove your uh, concept. Because previously you are using using Linux-based machines in lab. Now you have to use it in a real environment, not real environment, but real hardware. The next thing you have to do is demonstrate it in real hardware in space. If you're using if you are working with NASA, still it is experimental, but you have to uh, show that it works in a spacecraft in space before you actually go to the before you can succeed or if you are allowed to go to the real implementation. So it's still experimental, but in space, in real space. And as you can see from this, uh, as you can see from this, we usually in the university research, we usually hang around here. We do a lot of simulation. And sometimes we do Linux based prototype and we are still at level four. So whatever we develop in the lab at the university uh, is far, far away from the real implementation, which is over here. And in this project, in our case, we we went up to this level actually because we wanted to uh, because NASA wanted to figure out can we really implement it in a space environment. But if we want to go beyond this, that means we have to work with the companies who are operating those satellites uh, to test our scheme, which becomes a totally different ball game and. At that point, if you want to go beyond this point, then the funding organization has to make a big decision on investing big amount of money for you to work with those uh, satellite manufacturers. Uh, because at the university level, we cannot, we cannot go over that. We need their help because the university at the university environment, we don't operate satellites. So let me show you um, where we, what we did in order to do this, uh, to achieve this level. That means we are using the space hardware in lab in, in a lab environment. That's where we went up to. So this is a single uh, single single board computer, which is uh, in an operational satellite, which is operated by Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. is a company in Surrey, and they are operating the satellites. It's a operational satellite which is doing uh, disaster monitoring. And that means if there are fires or earthquakes, they monitor those things. Uh, so our question was, uh, can we implement this Sigma protocol in this piece of hardware, which is actually flying up in the satellites, this is real hardware. We had a copy of the, or we had an access to a copy of this hardware. So we could test our scheme on this hardware in the lab. Still, we're not in a space environment, but we are using the actual space hardware. So when we wanted to implement that, we ran into a lot of issues. This single board computer uses a power PC processor, which is very old and it has limited computing power. It uses an operating system, which is not Linux or it's not Windows, which, are, which we are used to. It uses r operating system, which is very crude and very primitive. The reason being they don't need all those complicated operating systems up in the satellite. Uh, in the satellite, those devices don't have a monitor, they don't have a keyboard, they don't have a mouse, they don't have a USB flash drive, nothing those. Uh, they don't need to schedule a calendar, nothing. They need to do basic functions. So in the space uh, hardware or in an operational hardware in the war field, you don't need a very complicated or sophisticated operating system like Linux or Windows. So they developed a very, they, they use a very primitive operating system, very rudimentary. When we wanted to implement our scheme over there, we ran into lots and lots of issues because we are used to sophisticated uh, operating systems like Linux. And when we want to implement it here, our scheme, we found that there's no HTTP, there's nothing there. 
and we spend lots and lots of time implementing those networking protocols in this hardware. And also this hardware has very limited memory. So we wanted, when we started implementing stuff, we ran out of memory. The lesson we learned from this was if you want to develop something for real implementation, you better look at the operational hardware before you start implementing your algorithm, before you start developing an algorithm, before you start developing anything in your lab with sophisticated operating system and sophisticated computers. That is a lesson we learned. And we learned it a very hard way because we developed a very nice scheme, just will develop a university environment and publish papers. But when we come to implement it, it's, to, it's a totally, completely different scenario. It's extremely difficult. Okay, I'll uh, conclude at this point. Uh, so satellite is going to be a very critical component of the global coverage because we want to cover it, cover everything to the terrestrial internet. And as soon as we do that, there, there will be mobility issues because the satellites are moving. Uh, most of the applications will be using LEO satellites and some of them may be using even the newer satellites called CubeSat, which are even closer to Earth and they move at a much higher speed. So mobility issue is going to be a big issue when we want to connect the satellites and the devices on the satellites to the terrestrial environment. And the last point is because of my practical experience with implementing stuff for real systems that pay very close attention to target systems before you develop the sophisticated protocols and uh, you have to develop the system for mission critical systems. They cannot break in a war field. You cannot develop, you cannot deploy a technology which breaks. You cannot develop a technology in space which breaks. In a lab, it's okay. A simulation is okay. Uh, so that is one big thing we need to understand because we work in university environment. We develop very sophisticated techniques, very sophisticated algorithms using very sophisticated computers. And our objective is to you know, publish papers. But when we are developing something for the mission, uh, we have to be very, very careful in what, uh, I mean, how we develop these protocols. They have to be very, very simple but they need to get the job done. With that, uh, I'm done with the presentation and I need to acknowledge a number of people who have been working in developing this Sigma protocol. Uh, the NASA and Cisco have been funding this project for quite some time. And there are a lot of people who have uh, helped with this project and I can't put the names of all of them. There are lots and lots of them. These are the main people. Uh, there are people from NASA who have been directly involved with our project. And there was uh, Lloyd from uh, Surrey in UK who was involved with our project as well. And uh, the rest are all PhD students and uh, other visitors. Some people came for and spent sabbatical uh, leave in, our, in, in this project with us. So I need to thank all of those people who have been helping us uh, in this project. And before I uh, finish, let me do a bit of uh, 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 Advertising for the journals, which uh, Dr. Sharkar mentioned, uh, I am the editor in chief of two journals. One of them is the Journal of Network and Computer Applications. Uh, it's published by Elsevier. And uh, he also mentioned the impact factor. So I need to mention uh, that issue. Uh, the impact factor of JNC has been going up steadily over the years. And the current impact factor, this is 2018. And I have the current number also from 2019, which is slightly higher, I'll show you that. Uh, and this also shows a comparison with other journals which are which publish similar papers which are in the same area transactions of mobile computing transactions of wireless communications computer communication transactions of networking and as you can see our our impact factor uh, is pretty close to all those uh, well known journals uh, uh, we are you are if you are looking at q1 q2 we are q1 in all the three categories in which our journal is uh, categorized by uh, by sci uh, the second so we are q1 in all the categories the second journal is the one i founded in 2014 it's called vehicular communications it's mainly communication between vehicles and uh, the 2000 impact factor was 3.53 and you can see the impact factors of 
the journals which, pub, which are in the same area. Uh, we are a new journal. We started four years back, five years back, four or five years back. So these are very established journals, but we achieved quite a bit of success within a short period of time. And uh, we were Q2 in 2018, but I'll show you the uh, numbers uh, this year. So these are the most recent impact factors. Uh, GNC is 5.6, up from 5.3 to 5.6. And vehicular communication is up from 3.5 to 4.7 this year. So these are the most recent impact factors and uh, they are pretty well established journals. So I really uh, uh, would like to request you to submit uh, high quality papers to either GNC or vehicular communications depending on your uh, area of research. With that, I'm going to uh, say thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Sarkar will probably say that we, have, we can take a few more que few questions. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Professor uh, M. Atikujavan for your nice talk. Uh, especially, I must uh, appreciate uh, your time because the, you know, in New Zealand, we have got actually 10 past uh, 6 p.m. But in uh, Oklahoma, perhaps, you know, 1.10 uh, a.m. You know, early in the morning. So you actually, this is the sleeping time, but you are giving you know, your time to give a talk. So thanks very much for your you know, excellent you know, contributions. Especially, I appreciate, uh, you know, this one. And I personally enjoy, you know, your actually, you know, uh, the talk, uh, especially that's related to our uh, research students, you know, uh, our subject we are teaching and so on. So that's very good. So uh, rather than uh, delaying, and I all must also, you know, uh, thanks uh, participants, especially, you know, this difficult time of the year, uh, busy also and COVID-19 and so on. So for that time to also, you know, participate in this uh, virtual talk. So thanks everyone. Uh, we have got time, perhaps I think we can take a couple of uh, questions and uh, if you have more questions, perhaps you can also forward your email to me, then perhaps I can uh, pass on to Professor Atiku Javan. So time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Uh, can I start with one or two short questions? Yep. Sure. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Atikul Javan. It was very interesting talk. I'm talking from New Zealand. It was uh, nice to meet you. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I have a couple of uh, points uh, to discuss. One is uh, about the handover time you showed in this slide, which is a couple of seconds. Uh, and those uh, and over time you obtained uh, for a very high speed instrumentation and also very critical uh, mission critical measurements where probably we need in microsecond or millisecond time of response and, uh, and decision making whether this will have an impact in such cases. Yeah, if you are using mobile IP it takes about 10 seconds for handoff. So that is clearly unsuitable for the type of applications you're talking about. There's absolutely no way 10 seconds would be uh, suitable for that. But if we are using the scheme we developed, the Sigma scheme, then you will see that there's no handoff time. The handoff time is virtually zero. Now it might feel uh, unbelievable, but I'll tell you what is happening, why it is zero because you are communicating through two different paths at the same time before you hand off. So when you hand off, you simply move from two communication channels to one communication channel. So the best example I can give you is if you are communicating using Wi-Fi from your smartphone, if you're using Wi-Fi and 4G at the same time, if at one point Wi-Fi breaks down, why 4G is still there? So you'll have no, no delay of our data communication. So that's the sort of thing we are doing. Okay, so that was hidden there. So That was uh, hidden there. <laughs> yeah, so that's quite clear. Okay, so that's fine. Another question about uh, the um, security aspects. Uh, you mentioned it's an important uh, aspect, but uh, you are not talking that part uh, of uh, thinking about implementing security. Uh, you are rather on the handoff 
side uh, because uh, this type of uh, satellite and uh, using resources as you showed in one of the slides hundreds of different things different satellites and resources are there um, uh, we are doing here uh, our phd student they're working with blockchain for decentralized uh, uh, um, blockchain implementation on d2d communication device to device under five generation networks uh, whether something similar can be thought about uh, implementing on that kind of uh, satellite resource utilization with the model that you are developing yeah i think the fundamental uh, one thing is we looked at every aspect almost every aspect we could think of uh, for this sigma because our objective was and still is to implement it in real missions up in the sky. But in this presentation, as you said, we only, I only showed you the basic fundamental stuff and the throughput, the performance, that it works, the principle works. We have looked at uh, security and we have few papers on that also. We have looked at scalability. Uh, we have looked at the power consumption of this protocol because if you want to implement in a battlefield, if you want to implement in space, power is a big issue. It's not like a lab where you just plug it in and then there are megawatts of power coming in. So we looked at all those issues, every aspect, survivability, security, everything we could think of. Even we looked at the, uh, uh, the ping pong effect that happens in handoff and we developed schemes for those. But in, in a presentation like this for 50 minutes or one hour, I'm sorry, I couldn't connect. I could. I didn't want to cover too much stuff, and uh, it would make you know it's very confusing. Too. So I just limited it to the basic principle. But you are absolutely right that uh, we looked at all those issues. Hmm. So uh, have you thought, or any of your colleagues or groups, thinking anything about the blockchain? Uh, blockchain is a more recent thing. We haven't actually uh, thought about it. We have started working on blockchain. It looks like very interesting from your discussion of what you have described because of the nature of decentralization. There is a possibility that it could work better. Correct. Correct. We have yeah. to uh, sit down and think which part of this scheme could benefit from blockchain. Mm -hmm. Because in blockchain, you have basically transactions and ledger and all those stuff. So here, which component, which part of the handoff fits into that category? That's mm -hmm. where blockchain would help. But if you have yeah. suggestions, uh, we can, we will be very interested to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so perhaps we can just take uh, one more <clears throat> question. That's the last one. Uh, uh, and thanks, Professor. Uh, this is Salman from Auckland. I have a very simple question. Uh, do we need to implement the Sigma on corresponding node as well? Uh, yes. And how could, uh, okay, that's, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so that is one thing, as I mentioned, that you have to implement the Sigma on both the ends, and you have to have SCTP running at both the ends, but SCTP is a standard protocol, so it's not an issue. The only issue is the applications you're going to run, they have to be recompiled with SCTP. And the applications we are looking at the, the space applications, there are only, you know, might be 50 applications, 100 applications by NASA, and they have the source code for those. So it's a matter of recompiling those, and it's very easy for them. Now, if you are thinking of recompiling the millions of applications in the Apple, you know, Play Store or Google Play Store, then of course a different issue, because we don't have the source code for those, and there are millions of them. So that would be a big issue, yes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Okay, so perhaps uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, mm -hmm. almost I think no time for actually uh, as I can uh, still thinking about Professor uh, M. Atiku Jaman, uh, his sleep time. You know, that's actually what's the time now? Uh, One twenty a.m. You know, early in the morning. So it's, it's a lot of you know also impact on family and so on. So I uh, thank you again, uh, Professor M. Atiku Jaman, for your time. 
giving us a nice lecture. And also, I think those of you have got more questions. Perhaps now we can also you know, send me an email or maybe look at uh, Professor Atiku Zaman's you know, uh, publications, recent publications, and so on. So on the behalf of the uh, IEEE uh, you know, Communication Society uh, in New Zealand, especially uh, North, South, and you know, Central uh, chapter, um, you know, so uh, thanking again uh, Professor Matiko Zaman for his nice talks. Thank you very much. I would also oh like to thank all of you for inviting me to this talk. It's a real pleasure to uh, talk to some of you, but uh, next time, hopefully, we'll be able to talk in person. Okay, so that would be good. So if we can visit. Okay, so thanks very much. Huh? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. And thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah.